I'm a DM bar going to decentral, making NFT from the DeFi use, being crypto poor but JP. And let's give our, our MC a round of applause. He's killing it over there. So um, <clears throat> I, followed, I followed instructions. We took a picture before we came on stage. We tweeted that out. Make sure that you're following these folks here. Retweet that. We tweeted at Decentral. So man, I am so excited for this conversation on the metaverse. Um, who here knows what the metaverse is? OK. I think most of us honestly don't, even us on stage, because it's still to be determined. So that's a little bit of a trick question, but we're still figuring it out, um, and we do have some metaverse experts up here. Really excited for that. Um, I'll, I'll let these folks uh, introduce themselves real quick. I'll introduce myself on the end, and then we'll just get started. So uh, over to you, my friend. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Excited to be here. Excited to be alongside a lot of builders. Uh, Paul Sue, CEO and founder of Decasonic. Decasonic is a Web3 native uh, venture fund. We fund Metaverse seed stage investments. I bet a lot of people are going to come talking to you after this. <laughs> All right, let's go over to Ian. Hey, my name is Ian Bellina, local here in Austin, founder and CEO of Token Metrics. We're an AI crypto platform that reaches crypto assets. We also have model, model portfolios and also a partner at Token Metrics Ventures. Thanks, Ian. Uh, let's go to Sean. Hey everyone, I'm Sean Chang. I'm a partner at Consensus Mesh. Um, we build and invest in a variety of different companies and technologies. We also are participants and members of Neon DAO, which is a metaverse focused investment DAO. And Tom. Hey, I'm uh, Tom Hoikendorf. I'm creative director at Somni Life, and we're a metaverse company working in the Web3 world, uh, creating uh, tools for people to build and uh, lots of fun features for users to uh, explore. Awesome. I'm excited for this conversation, I said. And, and my name is Jonathan G. Blanco. I'm the founder of NIFMINT. We're an NFT commerce infrastructure company. I've uh, been working in Web3 and commerce at Intersection since 2017. So I started this out a little bit tongue in cheek, like who knows what the metaverse is and says like, hey, we don't really know. Let, let's, let's just start there. You know, let's level set for a second. What is the metaverse? Um, we don't have to get overly nerdy here, but like, what is the interpretation of the metaverse that people are building in right now? Anybody just take a stab at this. I mean, I'll jump in. Uh, I mean, uh, just as we're thinking broadly on it, one of my favorite <laughs> concepts that keep on arising as we're doing development is basically everything in real life has a parallel that you can create in the metaverse, whether you're a builder of 3D houses that you can, like, we want to create opportunities for 3D modelers to be hired by other people to build a space for them in the metaverse. So the, the land stuff we've all understood, but it goes so much deeper with that, with basically any occupation, any activity that you're seeing in real life, you're trying to find the, the analogous uh, experience in the virtual world. I mean, I think to process this, uh, everything that I guess we might get into in this panel, I think it's important to acknowledge kind of what the historical term meant and its yeah, creation and bring it, bring you it. Know, you know, this point, I love this. How many people have read Snow Crash? All right, so there you go. You got about a fifth of the room. So created by Neil, uh, written by Neil Stevenson. Neil Stevenson is the gentleman that actually coined the term metaverse. And how we use it colloquially today is like we use it in reference and interchangeably with a lot of other things. I think. Um, you know, science fiction has done a great job of helping us figure out some of the, the exact things that we want to happen, like the mirrorverse. So maybe there's a mirrored Stranger Things type world whereby which you can have and do and uh, augment many of the same things that you might do in meat space. And I think the digitization of all those elements are kind of what we may use the term metaverse for today but it's not what was originally intended as what you know Metaverse was uh, when it was originally coined by, ne by, by Neil, as if we're friends. Yeah, and so I'd love for anybody to kind of piggyback off of that, right? Because I think that 
call it before the Web3 boom that took place uh, during the pandemic, you know, people were talking about metaverses back then, right? But we weren't fully associating them in a Web3 context. So does someone want to kind of help with that delineation for anybody? Maybe I could jump in. But before getting into crypto in 2013, I was an early employee at Zynga. And a lot of gaming product people like myself think of the metaverse as very much an extension of the gaming generation that's going on right now. There are kids growing up on Roblox. So as a venture investor now, we think of the metaverse in three specific definitions. One, it is the next generation internet for this younger gaming native generation. Two, it is an immersive hybrid, physical, and digital blend of this world. And then three, where it relates to Web3 is it's powered by meaningful relationships around digital money and digital ownership. You know, the, those three elements is how we think of this working definition to make you know, paradigm shifting technology investments at Decasonic. And, and to go along with that, Ian, um, you know, can there be a metaverse that is not Web3 or, or can we have med, are, like, are there actually... Yeah, I mean, I think it's possible. You yeah. have meta, but there I, you go. I don't think it's the metaverse we want. Right. I think we want competition. And I think the power of Web3 is now we can really have a metaverse that's not owned by anybody. Right. No central entity, no central party or government can come and just completely close it down. Right. Yeah, yeah, I always like to say it's like, hey, just because we might use the same words doesn't mean we mean the same things, <laughs> right? So for, um, you know, a uh, Fortune uh, 10 company to commandeer the word meta, um, I, I think, look, in fairness, I think it might be helpful to, for like a broader adoption context, um, but... Obviously, when you have for-profit maximizing entities, um, you know they have self-interest. So, so yeah, yeah. Just jump the, on in. The, this is the biggest battle since dot-com. You know, dot-com had AOL closed gardens versus open internet, information highway uh, by by Al Gore versus the open internet. You, you're going to see variants of the metaverse, a closed metaverse, likely Apple, Roblox, not Minecraft, Meta or the open metaverse. And, and a lot of us in this room believe in that open metaverse powered by NFTs and digital currencies. Um, you know, let, let's all build that open. Yeah. I think it's both good and bad. I think it's a double-edged sword. But I think in the short term, it's great for crypto and Web3 sure. because it's been the biggest advertising engine to onboard new people into, the, into this whole world, right? Metaverse, meta. Once people saw Facebook rebrand the entire business model for the metaverse, they knew this was the future. Yeah, that, that's big, right? For any... Um, NFTs began to blow up after that. Yeah, any company of that size um, doing that is, is, you know, signaling. There's some signaling there. Tom, go ahead. Yeah, you want to jump in? Oh, uh, yeah. I, was just, I mean, just relating to this whole Web 2, Web 3 metaverse uh, discussion, I mean, there's still so many practical problems that, like, the traditional gaming world solved with how you're structuring 3D assets and creating efficient multi, like, MMO systems that you still need to incorporate to be creating a really functional gaming system. So like as much as the permissionless data and all the Web3 stuff, it's like obviously we're working so hard to have that be the, the backbone of the whole system. There are still going to be traditional Web2 network structures that need to be utilized to create high functioning 60 FPS experiences in like HD. It's just part of the, the tech, tech uh, facts, you know. Yeah, and let's break that down for a second because, you know, Tom, you and I were talking about this backstage that um, the market for the metaverse right now isn't infinite, right? It's not, you know, there's 8 billion people on the planet. There's not going to be 8 billion people in the metaverse out the gate. Um, you know, my opinion is it's likely going to be people who are adjacent to gaming or adjacent to these sorts of spaces. Is that enough for right now? Like, can we, can we just focus on that target customer segment right now and, and create an industry there? Yeah, I mean, you know, with Sami Life, we're all about accessibility and web-based stuff and just giving people a chance to get straight in. And I, for, you know, from my point of view, that's, that's the absolute key. That's why I think things like having full-on Oculus 3D experiences, as much as they're super cool, you're just narrowing the market by such a huge amount. Even, you know, just having a local download on your computer, like, it's just things that stop people from getting into it. So, I mean, I feel like already it's limited already enough. I mean, there's enough people to fuel the, the, the development at the current stage it's at, but uh, I think accessibility is like 
pretty much, you know, number one for moving it forward. Yeah, Sean, Sean, what do you think on that? You know, like, what do you think about how, um, from a market side, you know, we're talking about positioning for the next market. So um, when a brand or a company or a business makes a decision, you know, they're thinking about what does this broader market look like? So uh, is there enough meat in, call it, the target customer base right now to make this viable for people to start thinking about from a business context? Yeah, I mean, myself, I'm, I'm a two-cycler. You know, I joined the space around 17, you know, so I've eaten shit, and I've also <laughs> been a part of multiple bulls. That's, why you're, feel, not, that's why you're not scared right now. No, 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 no. <laughs> exactly. I mean, like, people are like, oh, my gosh, we're in a bear. I'm like, yeah, I mean, ish. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that's not to say it's like, not to say it with, 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 uh, with pride, but more just like, a focus and more of just seeing repeatable patterns that we might have seen in 18 uh, and even early 19, where now is the most exciting time to be building. Like, is the TAM and the SOM and the SAM like big enough? Absolutely, because many of the promises of the people that have been the stalwarts and builders are still here, right? Like the fair weather folks that were just like, yeah, maybe I'll buy a little bit, maybe I'll figure it out, and maybe I'll do something more later. Like. Those folks might be be gone out, you know, out with the waves. But now I feel like we're now at a point where there's been enough retracement where the people that are showing up, traveling to a conference in the midst of a bear, that's a great sign, right? That's a great sign because I'm also excited about out of those people, out of these conferences, usually conferences during bear markets are the best because you're only sitting next to people left and right of you that actually want to be here. Not because number go up, not because it's the next big hype thing. You're here because you actually believe some element of this is actually going to push society forward. And I hope that the builders of this, this phase and this wave actually help to create new tools Right, like if you are, if you're a, a true builder, a true creative, in this instance, in this cycle, in this downturn, my hope is that you say, "What can I do with these paintbrushes? What can I paint with these tools?" That you create your own mediums. Maybe you say, "Maybe I'm not going to use a paintbrush. Maybe I'm going to use a spray paint can. Maybe I'm going to use a chisel." But those things are what we're creating now, and why it's the best time to be joining. We're, we're, we're so early in metaverse adoption. You know, Three billion gamers in the world today, 300 million crypto users today. Th those two numbers are still exploding. About 30 million VR devices, assuming the metaverse is VR. It's not. It, it, it probably looks more like Zoom 2.0 with the hybrid experiences. A, a lot of our digital lives bleed into our physical lives, and you, you're, you're only going to see that experience uh, grow over time. Uh, Ian, I love your thoughts, like, on the data side of this, right? And, like, what are, you know, you being on the, on the, the, the metrics and so forth, like, what, what is some of the data that we're seeing, or what is some of the information that we should all be considering and thinking about? So when it comes to the metaverse, it's really become a new trend through the catalyst of NFTs, right? Because now we have actual utility in the Web3 web world where people can, for example, in gaming, buy items and transfer them into different games, different worlds, right? And I think the next big trend I see in the metaverse is gaming, right? So from Yuga Labs with other deeds, with uh, Gala, Ill Illuvium, people are looking to have actual ownership in the metaverse, right? And I think NFTs have been the initial catalyst, but the next catalyst is gaming. We have yet to see a big game really implement NFTs and do it well. I think that will be a huge growth engine for the whole sector. Yeah. All right. So I've given you all the easy questions. So now I'm going to get hard. No, I'm just kidding. But look, one of the reasons I really wanted to be on this panel as a moderator is because this is you're, you're all educating me and, and feeding my own curiosity as well. Um, and so I want to kind of go through some of the call it like the overstated things that talk, get talked about with metaverse and like I, I want us to dissect that I want us to break it down so you know you're talking about the gaming use case totally agree that makes a ton of sense like hey if we're in the metaverse and you live in this you know alternate reality uh, and that being game and gamifying all that sort of stuff totally makes sense I have trouble with this whole notion of taking your NFTs cross-platform. 
So I want someone to give me like the pro, like, hey, this is going to happen and this is why we're going to take our NFTs across platform. I'm going to take my, you know, Fortnite skins to like a different game. And then someone give me the opposite of like why maybe that's not going to happen as soon as we think it would. Who, want, who wants to take the pro? Who wants to take the con? I can start with the Debbie Downer comment. Okay, let's I go mean, Debbie Downer. I mean, initially, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did anybody actually go to the Travis Scott Fort, Fortnite concert like in, in or experience that? Okay, so we have like five hands. So it was a railed experience, right? So a railed experience, basically concurrent users in a specific, you know, space was limited because of the bandwidth and compute constraints. And so when we talk about like millions of people, Coachella-like experiences, like from what I understand, that's not technically feasible today. Well, yeah. Yes. No, yes. Hey, this, this is what, is what it's all about because I have wanted, not yeah. seen or experienced experiences where I'm like, millions? Like we're ta- we're promising that and writing checks with our mouths, and I'm like, get them, Tom, I, get them. Okay, I want to okay. know. I want to know. No, we're Educate. hacking. We're hacking this right now. I'm really into this stuff. So um, I come from the music world, by the way. It's like my background. So I'm all for getting the live shows in the metaverse. And as much as yeah, having a million people in one scene, that's probably not going to happen. But what you can do is create a stated solution with your network and create like multiple instances or lobbies of that same scene. And you can, you can have a unified experience so everyone is experiencing the same thing. Maybe you're capping it at a few hundred or a thousand people per experience, but it's like, oh, you can find your person in different instances. The whole concert has been uh, synced up so everyone's experiencing the same show. You might not be in the same exact scene depending on how you're running it. Again, if you're running like a local download with some Unity engine and people are experiencing it like you would... Uh, like you know, World of Warcraft or something like that. There's the the power to fuel that many users. But realistically, if you want to have like an open web experience, you're just hitting limitations. Like you're 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 running on the WebGL engine. You've got a gigabyte of VRAM to to run it, and uh, yeah. So you know, different versions of it. Maybe not a full on million users in one scene, but uh, so you can cheat, basically, is what you're saying. This is my this is my <laughs> job. <laughs> this is what I do every day. Yeah, you know, on this topic of cross metaverse identity, you know, pros and cons. Sure. From the gaming perspective, I was an early employee at Zynga, where we innovated on real identity social gaming. We we proved to the world that people want to play games with their real identities and real friends. Uh, you know, you're seeing this in crypto and Web3 right now where you, know, you want to play with your other eight friends. And, and now you're dissecting different identities that you might hold different NFTs around. So not just real identities, but maybe your Twitter identity, maybe your friend identity, maybe your professional identity. The con of this is you have a lot of game developers who don't want that open connectivity. It, it ruins their business model. If you're porting over a Sony game to Xbox, they don't want those platforms intercommunicating. So that, that, those are the tailwinds and headwinds for this shared open metaverse. Identity. Yeah, it's natural, right? If, if, you, um, if your business model is based off of you know, sequestering value, um, why would you want to open that up? <laughs> Blue bubbles and I green mean, bubbles. I would right? say just, and Apple, like same thing. I yeah. mean, so does that mean you're, you as a user... Do you, are you starting to ask questions of the publishers even before you buy the token or buy the asset or the NFT? Like, do you, do you vote with your feet to essentially say, hey, if yeah, you're... If you, you have to. You know what I mean? Like, but I, I just feel like people are... That's a little too... Well, I mean, that's the ideal? whole point of Web3, right? Being able to vote I hope. <laughs> with your feet. And going back to, to what you said, publishers and businesses that have archaic models, they'll become obsolete. So they'll be forced to innovate. You're here. Simple as that. Yeah. I mean, I, I see it as like you can start creating open protocols for these characters. So, yeah, the people who want to be part of an open solution where we're all getting in on sharing a user character uh, in whatever ways, you it doesn't need to be, okay, this avatar is going to be useful in all these different games. Maybe it's just some simple stats that cross over. Or maybe it's your social profile because it's all based on Web3 connections. So you can just show up in a different game and your followers are already there. Or social communications and, uh, you know, it doesn't always have to be a, a single tangible avatar that's moving between them all. In the application world, in the gaming world, in the media world, content is king and fun is an endless opportunity. 
you know, if a publisher can continue to be siloed, close metaverse, and deliver fun, they'll, they'll still persist. The hardest thing is always building fun. And that, that's the tremendous challenge in a lot of product builders from the gaming world as they look at metaverse. I, I want the interop to work. I just feel like a lot of there's there's incentive mechanisms and ego and incumbents that prevent us from having the same shared schema, the shared scheme infrastructure, even the shared shared same standards around identity. And even though I, I want those things, I also think as a criticism of the Web3 community is that there is an oversimplification and almost disrespect totally. for those disciplines. Have you looked at the credits after a movie or a video game? How many freaking names do you see? And then you have NFT projects that are saying, oh, we're going to be launching a game very soon. Very soon. Very, very soon. Look at the roadmap. It's, it's on the like roadmap. four people. And you're like, have you talked to an engineer, a sound totally. designer, a set designer, anyone that works in the entertainment field for, for a living? And then you're, you're saying that you can promise that after how much you know, ETH volume off of an NFT sale? I think it's complete and utter like dog shit because you're like, because you want to pump the price, you promise those things, but you show no respect to the men and women that work in those fields, that have given their lives to those fields, that take decades to hone them. It, fun and entertainment, those are not things that just happen out of happenstance. They come out of discipline and real creativity. Yeah, Sean, so, you know, I don't, I, I, yeah, <laughs> definitely clap, clap on that. Clap Shout on out that. to you creators out there, especially, and, right? And, and because you took, in, took us in that direction, you know, I, you know I'm, I want to take us a little bit further in that, too, in that there's a, I believe that there's a big problem with an NFT project to create a game. Like you should have a game that has NFTs, right? Like, so like this whole like notion of like, oh, like we just did this 10,000 avatar PFP project and we promised a game as you're saying, um, you're, you're literally like offering something that with no security and then you're starting to promise things overall. So like, I think there's a broad, host of issues there and we all talk about like rug pulls and there's these rug pulls like look I'd like to think that most projects that go out there don't start out and be like oh we're gonna do a rug pull but they do they say like hey we're gonna do an nft uh we're gonna have a game and they're like oh shit this is actually difficult I'm gonna go back to my job now and we'll see what happens later see you guys and that's a rug pull so <laughs> go ahead, well I think oh. Go ahead, Ian. Well, I think that's why the fundamentals matter, right? Like with our platform, you have to look at the fundament of the team, their past history, can they execute? Exactly. Right? If you're just investing just to FOMO or just to ride the wave, then most of these products will fail, right? But I think in that outlier, there'll be 5% or less that actually execute it, and disrupt the whole space. It's quite possible to build fun within the guardrails of safety, accessibility, and and current limitations of infrastructure. I, I do a lot of work with Kadena, a next generation proof of work layer one. They have an NFT standard and, and a consensus mechanism that enables fun low def gaming it, it, if that's what we want to do. Let, let's set the expectations right of that's how early we are in this market. There are certain infrastructure providers that enable that aspect of fun. All right, so we're, we're close to wrapping up here, so I'm going to end with a kind of controversial take, and, and you guys can you know beat me up backstage later. Um, I think we might be in a metaverse bubble. So I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing, and I do think that metaverse long-term, 100% bullish on it. Um, but I think that we kind of got a little bit over our skis on like this value prop of metaverse and what it is and overall. And um, so I'm just curious, do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Are you going to slap me around backstage? Well, I mean, I think there's several, I think there's several bubbling elements that have contributed to that feeling. So I don't, I don't entirely disagree with that. Um, you know, the NFT systems entering the gaming world and how that pairs with like micro pay systems and stuff like that. That's huge, and that ties right into it. And the whole, you know, the PFP projects and getting that into the metaverse that's getting, you know, forced awkwardly in there in numerous ways, also fueling it. Um, I don't think it's conceptually a bubble. Like, I think that the, the end game is, is definitely real. And all these people that are pushing towards it, like, there are going to be some truly amazing experiences 
that are going to be getting created in the next. I mean, I feel like it's been a year. You know what I mean? Like, totally. and it's yeah. And just because there's a bubble doesn't mean it won't succeed. There was a dot com bubble. We're still using dot coms. I'm going to say the complete opposite. We we're not funding enough of the oh, metaverse awesome. opportunity. Awesome. There it is from um, Funder. If you believe this is eight to twelve trillion dollars in five to ten years, and Facebook is only making ten billion a quarter. Look at that expected return that they're yeah. looking great to po- fill. Great point. So, great when they spend you know, like twenty billion too, boil it down to metrics, and, and you know we're we're not investing enough as the open metaverse venture ecosystem. I love that. I love that take. Thank you, uh, Ian. Thoughts? I think we've seen nothing yet. This is just the, just the beginning. This think of metaverse as going through the version of Web 1, right? We haven't really seen an actual metaverse that's done well and gone mainstream. Once we have that, once we have lots of successful examples, then I think the bubble will go even higher. Yep. But I, I th- to factor in pricing right now, I think the market has crashed. So if anything, there's been a correction in this bubble. Nice. Sean? I agree that to an extent in, in that the metaverse is a bit in a bubble. Um, but only in light of incrementalism. And what I mean by that is people that take Web3 tools just to replicate Web2 models. And I think now is the time to actually start to build things that actually enable you to do things that are not actually possible today. And if that realm of possibility continues to grow, then I would say I more so agree with Paul in that we're not investing enough because crypto economic systems once applied to creativity and you know making sure that ownership is much more evenly distributed that's the way to grow something that's 100x you know 10x greater than anything that we could do in in today's traditional um, landscape I love all those responses. Um, you know, thank you all for joining this amazing panel. Uh, before we wrap, just real quick, Tom, d- er, go down the line, say your name again, and where they can follow you. Sure. Uh, Tom Heukendorf. You can uh, follow me on Twitter, just at, at T. Heukendorf, or you can just check out the at SomniLife Twitter uh, account. And yeah, creative director at SomniLife.com. Let's go down the line. Um, if you want to find me, you can find me on Twitter at Shacheng, S-H-A-C-H-E-N-G. And if you want to check out Mesh and everything that we're up to, our accelerator, our incubator, you can go to mesh.xyz. Yeah. You can find me at tokenmetrics.com and Twitter, Diary of a Made Man. Paul Su, Paul Su on Twitter, Paul Su on LinkedIn, decasonic.com. Thanks for having me. And I'm JG Product on Twitter um, or at NiftMint. Uh, and we'll be in the corner in that hallway if you all want to chat with us afterwards. So big round of applause for us. Our amazing, amazing panel. Thanks so much, everybody.